All right. Well, good morning. Isn't it great to see the sunshine? Yes. How many of you already have a sunburn? Come on. A few. Okay, just a few. Last service, there were like two, and I was like, I'm disappointed. Um, we had some good sunshine yesterday, so I hope you enjoyed it. It's going to get extra warm this morning, so um, enjoy the air conditioning a little bit, and then go play. Um, but truly, I'm glad that, that uh, summer has shown up, because we leave for kids camp tomorrow, and if it, if it were still the winter weather, we had you know, just a week ago, I was feeling a little nervous. Um, but I do want to come uh, before you this morning and just share a few announcements, uh, but also share with you uh, something really awesome that happened in our staff this week. Um, I'm just really blessed by the fact that you can see God's hand moving in so many different ways. It's awesome to see God's hand moving on our benevolence team and our youth team and our kids teams and all the teams here at MRCC. But one thing that happened this week, uh, Pastor Weston had actually prepared a sermon for July 10th, which is like quite a ways down the road, right? But he'd already written it. And I remember him saying in passing, mind you, man, this is a great like sermon for the start of a sabbatical. And I was like, haha, well, you're not till July 10th. And then some different things were happening this week. And it just, it just, the puzzle pieces came together. And Pastor Greg is out. He says, I'm going. I'm going to leave and take advantage of this nice, you know, non-winter weather And because Pastor Weston is ready. So uh, we have sent him on his sabbatical already, and he is on the road, and uh, we are praying a blessing over him as he goes. Um, but today, Pastor Weston is going to bring a sermon, and I believe that it is the right sermon to start his sabbatical. You'll hear why, because I don't want to spoil it. But I got to hear some of the stories ahead of time, and I was like, amen, this is just a beautiful beginning uh, to that sabbatical. So we'll pray together over Pastor Greg in just a minute after I share a couple of announcements because it is summer. We have movie nights. If you if you haven't ever been a part of MRCC's family movie nights, they're at night outside on the yard. It's beautiful. This movie starts at sunset. It's July 8th. We're going to be watching Sing 2. Uh, it's going to be a fun movie. It's a newer one. Sing 1 was amazing. Sing 2 is almost amazing. I'm teasing. It's going <laughs> to... Isn't that the way it is? With the, anyway, actually, it is a really good movie. It'll be a lot of fun, but it really is a great way just for your family to come around. It's, it's community, and it's a beautiful opportunity to just come together and have some fun. Uh, but also, another time we love to have fun, right? Church picnics are coming up. Uh, the church picnic, the first one is July 17th, but I tell you about it now because we're going to need help. If you, if you can imagine the 5,000 moving parts to get a church picnic together, we need your help. And you can sign up right online. There's a QR code on your CBAC, or you can just go to mrccnow.org, and you can sign up to help, whether it's cooking team or inflatables team or grilling burger. We need people to flip some burgers and grill. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but the only way it's going to be awesome is if we have your help. So if you can help, let us know. That would be awesome. Uh, sign up online. The other thing you can sign up online for is um, Cookies for a Cause is uh, Marcy Van Winkle attends here. She has this ministry, and she is offered to do these classes to help support our building fund. So you see these beautiful pictures right here? Uh, you can learn how to do that. She makes the cookies. You do the frosting. And if you don't believe you can do that, Marcy will teach you. It's amazing. There's only 20 spots, though, for each one, so you do have to sign up. She can only manage so many people in a class, and she needs to know how many cookies make, all that. But it costs $50 so that that money can go into our building fund. So uh, sign up. It'll be a lot of fun, and you'll support our kids' building hopefully coming soon your way, right? <laughs> okay, just a couple really fast last ones, like right away today. If you are a senior, there uh, is prime timers today at 1230. We're going to have lunch together, so come on, enjoy it. You can determine what a senior is, whether it's just a little bit older than me or a lot older than me. <laughs> come and have lunch with us today because uh, a senior can be, you determine what that is because uh Janae, who works with me, likes to hang out with the seniors. They're like her favorite people. So come and hang out with Janae, have some lunch. Or uh, men, come to Band of Brothers tomorrow night. We're going to continue Band of Brothers throughout the summer. They just wanted to keep that momentum going. So, uh, gentlemen, it's a great time for you to come together, have some community uh, as men uh, teaching and growing and being in community together with Christ. Amen. That's good stuff. Um, I'm going to pray over our time this morning, over Pastor Greg's sabbatical, and then uh, we're going to invite Weston up to preach. Jesus, we are thankful for this opportunity we have to be together, to be here. And God, we pray a blessing over Pastor Greg as he cycles off toward California. But Lord, more importantly, as he's going, that you would be speaking into his heart. God, that you would be 
with him every moment of that time, that you would be giving him rest, but also direction and discernment for our church, God, that this is a beautiful time uh, for him to really spend with you. So we ask you, God, um, that you would be present in every moment along his journey. We ask for safety over him. We ask for uh, just that provision as he goes from here. God, we pray a blessing over our church while he's not here. God, that we would stay together as a community, as a body of believers that support the leading of our pastor in this time. And we just pray, God, that you would continue providing, that you continue doing all the things you're doing here in this church body, that, God, we would encourage each other and build each other up uh, all summer long in this time that we have together. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for the message message that's about to come. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. With that, Pastor Weston, come on up. But can I say, I'm excited for this. Oh, Pastor Greg Thanks. has also, like the whole summer, he has lined up a lot of really awesome speakers. I'm and I think it's excited. cool that you get to start us off. It's cool and very intimidating. Thanks. <laughs> Not this intimidating. This is utterly terrifying. <laughs> hey, th thank you guys so much. Good morning, church. I will say, it is, it's an honor to be with you today. Share a message that's actually been on my heart for a while. But before we start, I just wanted to tell you just how much I have enjoyed being your worship pastor, getting to know you, and being a part of this MRCC family for its crazy thing for the last four and a half years. Isn't that nuts? What happened? But ever since we moved here from Reno, Nevada, uh, my wife Stacy and I have felt welcomed with open arms, and it feels good to have laid down roots and started a family of our own. This is our family here now, um, me, my wife, Stacy, and our daughter, Brielle, and it's just good to serve at a loving church, and if I could tell you anything about MRCC, it's that this church is very good at loving people. I mean, I think every single person here is a testament to that, and it's just a tremendous blessing to serve here with you. Uh, before we dive into God's Word together, just a quick question. Have you ever been part of a group or a group of individuals or a club or a team where you felt like you could thrive together, where you could get stuff done and also fully be yourself alongside each other. As you might know, if you follow me on Facebook, my wife and I are big movie nerds. In fact, unfortunately for you, most of our church pastoral staff consists of nerds, so I'm really sorry about that. But I can, I can easily look to movies to see examples of strong groups and strong teamwork. Groups like The Magnificent Seven or Ocean's Eleven or The Rebel Alliance or Ghostbusters or The Goonies or Greg's favorite, Starfleet. Nerd. Teams like The Mighty Ducks or The Incredibles or my favorite, The Avengers or The Fellowship of the Ring, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and of course, the Channel 4 News team. Yes, I've watched a ton of movies, and I can tell you that the one thing that all of these teams had in common was that they weren't perfect, but they got stuff done. All these teams were able to unite despite their differences, for the greater good of the mission. And I feel like this is what God would like us to talk about today. And the timing seems perfect with today being the first Sunday during our lead pastor's sabbatical season. Man, what an opportunity to pursue God and ask, how can we as the church stand up and stand strong to build unity, community, and teamwork within the body of Christ? Would you just pray with me? Father, would you can just speak to us in these next few moments together? Holy Spirit, would you have your way in these next few moments? Give us ears to ear, eyes to see, and to speak directly to our hearts here and now. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've been the worship pastor here at MRCC now for four and a half years, and I've loved every minute of it. And year after year, I've been blessed seeing new faces call MRCC their home. And I thought that it might be a good opportunity to share just a little bit of my story with you because God calls us to share our stories and how he's changed us. And I believe that there's power in our testimonies. And I love this quote where it says, only God can turn a mess into a message, a test into a testimony, 
a trial into a triumph, a victim into a victory. And so today, I look to Psalm 22, 22 for encouragement, where it says, I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. So to share a little of my story, I grew up passively going to church because my mom would take us, and she started attending church when her friend introduced her to Jesus during some difficult health complications between me and my twin brother. Some of you may not know, I actually have a twin brother. But uh, in my elementary years, I remember going to church, making friends, going to camp, singing the songs, and not realizing how much I needed that stuff until we stopped going. Because my parents, they ended up getting a divorce. And through that time, my mom stopped attending church, and so did my brothers and I. And in middle school, I got very depressed and emo. I'd wear tight jeans and have bangs, and this is how I looked. I listened to all the depressing and emo music I could. I made friends with others who felt the same way as me because there was just something about relating to someone else who was going through the same thing I was. Even though I could admit we were definitely emotional and whiny, and we fed into each other's emotions a bit. But what I was experiencing was the power of community. And I found that my heart longed for connection. And so in high school, uh, I started a band, and we called ourselves Wrong Direction. And this was way before One Direction. But it was with the intention of writing emo, like emotional songs. And my older brother, who was our drummer, met a guitarist named Jimmy. And Jimmy was insane at guitar, like really insane. He's definitely among the ranks of Todd and a lot of our other guitar players here. Uh, but like really insane. He auditioned for the band and we let him in like after five seconds of playing. And we would practice, we would write songs, we would play shows. And then one day he invited me to his church's youth group named Fusion. And I hadn't attended a church function for years at this point. And I was hesitant and I didn't know what to expect. But when you're in a band with somebody, you're basically family. And so as a brother, I accepted and went. And I attended Fusion. I saw a lot of kids just like me, people I could relate to. A lot of emos were there. And I saw a community unlike anything I've seen from teens my age. I saw a community of broken people seeking answers, seeking direction, gathering together in recognition of the answer that is Jesus. And just like our own culture youth ministry, we would gather every Wednesday night, hang out. We'd play crazy games, which always involved eating gross food blended together. But we would also worship Jesus together. We would pray for each other, and we'd hear a message from our pastor, Jason. And I love Jason, and his son's name was Easton. So we'd always joke about Weston and Easton, and we'd hope to one day meet a Northston and a Southston. And it has not happened yet. But I would, I'd attend Fusion every week, and it became my little church community. And it was a time that was essential in my life when I needed to be reminded of my identity as a wandering, lost teenager. And God was planting the seeds of what would produce the biggest fruit in my life. And I remember we attended a youth conference, and during worship at this conference, in the midst of his presence, it all clicked for me. Everything that I've been hearing about God, about Jesus for years, it all became real. My brokenness, my sinfulness, recognizing that no matter how hard I tried, I'd never overcome on my own. I was in need of a perfect, beautiful Savior, and his name was Jesus. And he was patiently waiting for me. And in that moment, I fell to my knees, and I made Jesus the Lord of my life, and my life would never be the same again it was also around this time that I got my first experience leading worship with the Fusion youth team. But I can tell you as a sheep who's prone to wander, I found that getting older, it wasn't easy. And I fell from the church, coincidentally, after our youth pastor was deported back to Canada. He was here on a green card. 
And it was ironic that I shared this story the same day our pastor surprised us with an early departure. I absolutely, I absolutely loved our youth pastor, Jason. He was instrumental in helping me understand the gospel. And when he and his family went back to Canada, I was devastated. And I can see that in hindsight, I was so dependent on my teacher that I neglected my dependency on my Savior. And then having recently graduated high school, I felt too old to attend youth group anymore, so I was invited to Sunday church. But then when I went to Sunday church, I felt like I wasn't amongst people like myself that I wouldn't be able to relate or be accepted. And so I wandered away into a few self-destructive years. But God's grace found its way back to me, as he tends to do. And he did it through my wife, Stacy, who was newly on fire for God, who invited me to church. And I accepted, mostly because I had a crush on Stace. But never underestimate how God can reach you, because at church, in his presence, he reminded me of my need for a Savior and for community. And this is where he opened my eyes to the beauty of his church. And God led us to a church named Outlook where we felt a love and a place of belonging that we hadn't experienced in our lives before. It was like I was back at youth group, a church filled with broken and imperfect people in worship of their perfect Savior. And this was a diverse church of, of many ages and ethnicities. And when I first felt like I couldn't relate to a community of people who weren't the same age as me or the same mindset as me, God revealed in my heart that the one thing that relates all of us is our need for him. And this is why church is so important. Our souls long for connection and community with those who share our struggle, with those who provide safety and honesty and humility this is the community that our hearts crave and that God loves to see. And it's a place where we all belong despite our differences. And it's a place where our calling comes alive. And at Outlook, we weren't perfect. We had a few messy seasons. We witnessed faithful serving from a body of believers throughout seasons of budget cuts, leadership conflicts, numerical growth and decline, a move into a new building and the struggles associated with that, which even led to some personal attacks. But throughout all the messiness, we also witnessed many lives transformed for Christ. Lives changed. Community outreach in downtown Reno. Mission trips to Thailand and Guatemala. A worship revival throughout our church culture. God proved that he was greater than our mess, that he was greater than our humanness. And through the highs and lows, we would attend and serve there for eight years under our pastor, Dan, where I would volunteer on the worship team almost every week. And for the last two years we served there, I actually became their worship pastor, which kick-started this whole wild journey that led us to this church, the place we now call home and have laid down roots ready to follow God's call to reach the lost and serve his beautiful church. And when I look across this room, I see a collection of stories, each with its own powerful journey that has led them to this moment, to this place, with this body of believers. And this is a thing that God loves because God loves his church and we're called to do the same. So as we begin to dig into the word, would you allow me to pose this striking question? Have you noticed or witnessed in yours or somebody else's life an attitude where, forgive me for saying this, where churches are dumped faster than a middle school boyfriend? Can I say that? Where, where like the congregations are kind of sized up and the worship and teaching is sampled and then discarded like it's kind of a church buffet. How do we prevent dedicated churchgoers who commit for the long haul from becoming a rarity? And see, this was the striking observation that I had 
when looking into God's word for direction. So let's open his word together, and I invite you to look with me as we ask God and Holy Spirit to reveal to us a model of what loving the church can look like. Would you turn with me to the book of Ephesians? And we're going to be in chapter 4, the beginning of chapter 4 in Ephesians. And I'll be reading the words on the screen from the New Living Translation, which does a great job with this language to understand and apply today. But whether you're reading from NIV, ESV, or the King James, be sure to highlight these verses in Ephesians and let it build us up as a church. And it's written by the Apostle Paul. And if you know Paul, he used to actually put Christians in prison until Jesus rocked his world and used him to spread the church. And he, then he himself ended up in prison for pursuing his calling. And yet some say he made the biggest impact in the world from prison. And so he writes here to the church in Ephesus, Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, Binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. Gosh, I love this verse. It is so rich, so deep, and these are just words that are good and a good reminder. They ring with the oneness that Greg has preached on in throughout Romans and that the church is encouraged to follow and the unity that Paul refers to in verse 3, it's the focus of a united body. In other words, not focusing on different churches, but one true universal church of Christ. That, that every saved believer is a member of this one body, even if they consider themselves part of a, of a denomination within the church. He's referencing the whole church, the capital C church, the body of all believers, and the one spirit that unites us is the Holy Spirit. And it unites all believers in Christ. And all believers are called to the same hope of a future eternity with him. And if we continue reading in verse 5, it says, There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. And I love reading this when combined with the previous verses because what we're witnessing is the entire Trinity at work. The Godhead, three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit. Paul says there is one Lord, and this is Jesus. He says there is one faith, and he's referring to salvation, which he expands on earlier in Ephesians chapter 2. When he says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And he's, sh he's showing her that a foundation of faith is important for true unity in the church. He says one baptism, this public confession of faith, that identifies a person as a follower of Christ who has accepted Jesus as Lord. And then he says, one God and Father of all. And isn't it amazing to realize, just like we sang today, that we are saved by the same grace of the same God of the Old and New Testaments. And unlike any religion, we worship a God who is uniquely Father, Son, and Spirit. And Paul writes that this Father is over all, in all, and living through all. And he does this to cover every aspect which God could be sovereign over. That there's no God or being higher than him. That every follower of Christ clings to this belief of one God. And in fact, it's so fundamental and so critical to the faith that you can trace it all the way back to the very first words of Scripture where it says, in the beginning, God, singular God, created the heavens and the earth. And so as we unravel this rich scripture, there are certain takeaways that we can walk with in our pursuit of church and community. And the first is that God loves his church. 
God loves his church even though we're weak and imperfect. And there's a quote from Bill Hybels, who is the founding pastor of Willow Creek Community Church, which our staff actually got to visit a few years ago. But he says, the local church is the hope of the world. And as, man, great quote. And as a follower of Jesus, we should believe this passionately and love the church for it because the church is the body of Christ. And Christ is the true hope of the world. In other words, the father put all his eggs in the son's basket. Or in Nevada talk, if you'd let me, God bet all in on his son's body and bride. And we are called to love her fully and completely. For example, when I married my bride, Stacy, I didn't choose to only love part of her. But I chose to love and commit to her fully. We chose to be there for each other regardless of whatever baggage was brought into the other's lives. And I'll admit her baggage was much lighter than mine. <laughs> but in the same way as God does, are we capable of loving the church despite its baggage? Can we do all we can to avoid developing entourages and cliques within the church with inside jokes and like us and them behavior. How can we be one? How can we be the people of God? You see, God delights in his people so much so that he kind of just throws an explanation to the wind. Listen to these words from back in the book of Deuteronomy, and it's directed towards some of his earliest group of followers, the nation of Israel. It says, The Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other nations, for you were the smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you. In other words, towards the church, he says, I love her because I love her. He says, I love her, warts and all, kind of like Nanny McPhee up here. That's the church. <laughs> you see, we know that the church is filled with humans, and as humans, we are imperfect. We struggle, and it isn't perfection that makes his church. The fact of the matter is God loves his church not because of her strength, perfection, or size, just because that's his heart. It's for community, and it's for you. And when we share God's heart for the church, then we can strive for a unity that consists of multiple generations and cultures and, and makes room for the mentally and physically disabled and the poor and the homeless and the broken in spirit and, yes, even our crazy children. Because church is a place of community, compassion, and forgiveness. And part of loving the church well is being reminded that she is a community. You know, with some perspective as your worship pastor, I can attest that in this technologically driven time that we are in, it's easier than ever to individualize our worship, our faith, and even our practices. You know, because with the push of a button... I can listen to whatever worship songs uh, fit my subjective preferences. With the push of a button, I can read a book from any author or subject to help affirm beliefs that I might already have. With the push of a button, I can watch an entertaining sermon from any passionate preacher of my choosing. But when we gather to worship, true community happens when we recognize that it's not Jesus and me, but it's Jesus and we. Because despite all our differences and preferences, the one thing that unites all of us is our need for grace and forgiveness. And when we gather to worship in community, we are encountering God together. We all have a need for peace forgiveness, and freedom. And this is found in Jesus. And since we've received his love and forgiveness, he asks us to extend that love onto others and to build a community centered around this love. In Colossians, it says, 
bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And you see, loving the church as the church, it means a willingness to set aside our preferences and our expectations to bear with one another in love, grace, and forgiveness while, you, while valuing the body as a whole. Because Jesus, he's the great unifier, and only he has the power to unite many different walks of life. And in this room today, we could have a, a financially blessed business owner sitting right next to the struggling waiter or waitress who wonders if they'll make ends meet. But regardless of any worldly status, when we are in the community of God, we are all humbled before him without status. In Romans, it says, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And I love this. Don't think you know it all. And despite somebody's behavior on the outside, we may never truly know what the person sitting next to us is going through. They may have had a family member or a dear friend pass away recently. They may be struggling with emotional and mental health. They may be facing problems at home. They may be wrestling with guilt for the things they've done. Again, we all have a need for the grace and the forgiveness of Christ. Let us extend it to his church. And as we continue in Ephesians 4, Paul is going to begin to highlight gifts that Christ gives to his church and how to mature, love, and unite together while applying our uniquely different gifts and talents. If you would pick it up in verse 7, Paul writes, However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. And he's referencing here the ascension of Jesus, that after his ascension, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and gave spiritual gifts to God's people. And First Peter expands on this and says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And when we read this verse, we see again this theme of grace. It's, this time it's focusing on spiritual gifts. And while our faith is unified under a single God, God brings each person exactly what they need depending on who and where they are as well as their own unique giftings. And the fact is your gifts, they might be different than mine. And let us not be envious of others' gifts when compared to ours. Because early in Ephesians, even Paul himself shows us that he wasn't worried about the gifts he didn't have. Instead, Paul was focused on getting the most out of what he had been given by God. And then the focus of these verses is not on how many gifts or even which gifts a person has. Rather, the point is that Christians should strive to use the gifts God has given in order to serve others and serve God. And if we pick it up in verse 11, Paul writes this about some more gifts. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. And I think it's important to note that we hear these gifts and these teachers, and God encourages all of us to learn and to share the good news. And these leaders named are those with a specific calling from God. Listed here are the apostles who traveled and shared the gospel and started new churches. Listed are pastors or elders who would lead the local churches and teach. Listed also are teachers who would teach God's word to others at these churches. And then also are the evangelists who were literally anyone who would share the good news. And there are some spiritual leaders that God gives, as Paul puts it, as a gift to the church. 
and those with God's calling as a first priority in their life. And it isn't the mission of these leaders to hoard any glory or respect or attention for themselves, but it's the overall mission for every Christian leader to equip God's people. It's the idea of training believers to serve God and to serve others. And notice that Paul's wording, it's less focused on schooling or academics, but it strongly focuses on work, on practice, on getting your hands dirty. Because to serve God and to serve his church, and we can attest to this as the worship team, it requires energy. And believe me, rolling into MRCC every Sunday at 5.30 in the morning while serving and worshiping with a whole heart for seven hours, it definitely requires energy. And I can tell you that the Sunday afternoon nap is real and needed. <sighs> Hallelujah. Even though Sundays are physically and emotionally exhausting for me, it's also the very thing that satisfies my spirit. It's spiritually rewarding because I get to put to action the call of the church, putting others' needs before my own. And can I tell you that if, if COVID, the, this COVID time that we had, if it's taught me anything, it's that ministry is hard to do from a distance because personal involvement is required in order to have the greatest impact. And the goal of serving others it's to build up the body of Christ. And in many modern churches, one pastor is expected to provide most, if not all, of the ministry work for those in the congregation. Pastor Greg has shared stories with me in his early years of ministry where he simultaneously operated as lead pastor, community pastor, a counselor, children's pastor, the accountant, the head of the board, and so help us even the worship pastor. All at the same time. But all, he told me what he learned was that joy and growth comes when others get to use their spiritual gifts. When God's people don't serve, it's easy for the congregation's growth to plateau. But as we are serving, we are creating opportunities for discipleship and growing in maturity. Now, this maturity, obviously, Paul's not... Uh, referencing growing in biological maturity, but instead he means spiritual growth. And let's ask ourselves, how do we know if we're growing and maturing spiritually? How do we know this? Uh, I asked perhaps to write these down, these next few examples, just for us to ponder ourselves. But it could include increases in the fruits of the Spirit. How do we know if we're growing and maturing spiritually, maybe we'd be seeing increases in the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. More love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Maybe we would see increased love for both God, and this can be difficult, and others. Increased love for both God Others, maybe. And maybe we'd see an increasing fullness of Christ in us or Christ-likeness. Are we becoming more and more like the Christ we worship that we, that we um, experience through his word? Are we becoming more like Christ, the perfect model? Listen to these words from Hebrews. It says, solid food is for those who are mature who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. And you see, the more we mature and grow and learn and train and serve, the more we grow in the fullness of Christ and the stronger our discernment becomes while navigating this difficult world that we're in. And what a good thing it is to grow in his likeness because after all, as we serve and live out our days, we represent him. We are his representatives. And so would you jump back into Ephesians 4 with me as we finish this passage? Picking up in verse 14, Paul writes, referring to when after we mature in Christ, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. 
We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. And just like we learned a few weeks ago with Pastor Greg, one result from maturing as a believer is not being tricked by false teaching. And I remember when I was a kid, my older brother would tell me all these elaborate stories about monsters and aliens, and they were all made up. And me, an immature kid, I would believe all of it. Plus, it'd give me nightmares. And now that I'm older and slightly more mature, only slightly, I've learned that these things aren't real. And as a result of that, I have no fear of them. And in the same way, when we are mature with Christ, we can stand against lies and deceit. And we can stay planted through every wind of new teaching, theology, or spirituality that comes our way. Because false teaching, it changes so regularly. And those who are immature can easily be fooled into thinking that false teaching is accurate. In fact, later in Ephesians, Paul will add that believers can put on the armor of God so that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the enemy and that God is our confidence and he is our truth. And another sign of maturity in Christ is the ability to speak the truth in love. Back in Ephesians 4, verse 15, it says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. And notice how Paul highlights the importance of speaking what is right with the right attitude. Because immature believers, and I have definitely been guilty of this, can make the false choice of speaking truth without love or speaking love without truth. And to speak the truth in love includes how we as Christians communicate with fellow believers and unbelievers alike. And with unbelievers, we are told to be ready at all times to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Church, hear me. And this is from my heart. Forgive me, but I'm still growing, still maturing. And the more I learn about Christ and dig into God's word, the more I firmly believe that there's no reason why a Christian has to be mean-spirited in order to be accurate when sharing our faith with others. Instead, let us speak the truth in love, letting God's spirit work boldly in us and through us to help others come to Christ. And finishing our passage in Ephesians 4, after describing Christ as the head, in verse 15, Paul now discusses the rest of the spiritual body of the church. In verse 16, it says, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Each individual part must work together according to its design and purpose and in the intended way in order for the body to function properly. And this means that when one person is weak, the rest of the body of Christ suffers. Think of the human body. If you break a foot or a leg, the rest of your body would need to work harder to compensate for the broken part. And when, and when the human body is healthy, it grows. And spiritually speaking, when we, the members of the body of Christ, work together in unity— as we should, the church builds itself up in love and it attracts others to the gospel of Christ and those people are being added to the family of God. Amen. And friends, would you agree with me that a healthy church is far more powerful than a big church? And I think it's, I think it's healthy for us to look toward church health rather than church size as what defines success within a congregation. Because when we look in God's word, it was vibrant and lived out Christianity that led to the rapid growth and spread of the early church. And imagine what we, the church, would be capable of holding to those same values, fully united as one. You know, in closing, when I shared the idea of this sermon with one of our MRCC family, Caleb McCracken, He's actually uh, serving with us over the next six months in a pastoral internship. He mentioned to me that the, the picture that's painted in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and I thought that this would be a great verse to finish with. It reads, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, 
but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. It's a beautiful picture showing the strength of unity. And I like to imagine one of those strands being me. And then the second being Jesus. And then the third being the church, stronger together, living in harmony, healthy, growing, maturing. Remember, Christ is the great unifier. The thing that unites us all is our ultimate need for saving grace. And when we are saved, we are adopted to the family of God, this unified body of Christ. And this is our identity as the church. Remember when he saved you, what he brought you out of, what he delivered you from. And look around. We can look around today and see his bride and the family we've been adopted into. And like Greg says, we may not look like much, but we can trust with confidence that Christ loves his church and let us do the same. And friends, if it's okay with you, I just wanted to share with this very short video. And just like we learned today, the importance of extending forgiveness and grace I will ask you to do the same for me right now because the video is definitely silly and goofy. It comes from a Christian comedian on TikTok and YouTube named Cool Carl. Yes, it's funny, but honestly, it does a great job at showing what it's like to finally find that place of community, forgiveness, and identity. Check it out. Yo. What up, dude? What's up? What up? What up? Yo. What's up, dude? <laughs> what it do, boo? <laughs> What's going on, man? Not a lot, man. Just chilling. Cool, cool, cool. So, uh, what are you up to this weekend? Thinking about going roller skating on Sunday. Oh, dope. I'd love to go. Uh, actually, I'm busy in the morning, but, I mean, the afternoon, I'd love to go. What you got going on? Oh, I'm going to church. Church? Like church church? Yep. Since when do you go to church? For the past month or so. It's pretty cool. Oh, I bet it is. Sorry? Nothing. You're just a Christian now, right? Yeah. You love God now, right? Yeah. Devote your life to him because he's given you what? I mean, unconditional love, forgiveness. Which one? Both. Oh, both. <laughs> so God's going to love you no matter what you do or say, huh? Basically. So no matter what you do, you're going to be forgiven, huh? Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm sure you love the fact that Jesus gave up his life to free you from that sin and then rose again three days later. <laughs> I'm sure you totally believe that. Yeah, actually, I do. And that gives you hope and enough strength to get out of the bed and face every day. Totally. Oh, and now you've chosen to follow God for the rest of your life. And make disciples and teach people the true meaning of life. I hope so, yeah. And you'll be kind to forgive people when they're mean, even if it doesn't make any sense. Absolutely. Yeah, and even though you mess up, God still loves you and he's still with you. Exactly. I learned that at church. It's pretty cool. Oh, I bet you it's so cool. I bet you has a preacher and everything, huh? Yeah. And that preacher teaches you about the Bible, and everyone there is greeting you, and they're so happy to see you. Yep. And now that you're saved, you're going to church, and now your life has more joy and direction of purpose. Yeah, it's awesome. Awesome, totally, yeah. Now you have promised salvation, and you get to spend eternity with God. No sickness or death or sadness. No pain, no tragedy. Pretty much. Uh, you good? That sounds so nice. It is. That sounds so good. I know. I want to go to church. I want people, I want people to care about me. I love you, man. <laughs> I will tell you that I love. Thank you. I don't know what, okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's all right. Just, yep, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Yep. Yeah. yeah, okay. It's all right. I love that. You see, when the church is loving the way that God loves, man, that should be the response. This is the power of community, unity, maturity, truth and love, and grace on display. And I can tell you, it's enough to make a grown man cry. And, you know, it was my intention that we would be able to respond with worship, putting action to what we've learned today. Obviously, we're way late. I'm so sorry. So striking that. But... What we would have done, so you just kind of hear my heart, we would unite together singing that song called This I Believe, with the lyrics saying, I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. But we would flip it in the community of our brothers and sisters, and we would proclaim as a song of the church, we believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. Such an important truth to declare as is church. And so would you pray with me? 
Father, we just thank you. We thank you for speaking to our hearts today. We thank you for the depths that you've rescued us out of and have adopted us to your family, to the kingdom of God, to the capital C church, wherever we end up, wherever our journey takes us. God, we just thank you that we are at a place of belonging. And I pray if that's, if somebody's come in today just learning about what this whole church thing is, God, I just pray that they can make you the Lord of their life right now, that they can say, yes, I'm broken. I've drifted too far. I am in need of a Savior. Lord, would you be the Savior of my life? We can do that in this moment right now. You.